Exactly. I think he was a, he was a good soldier, but he was very very fair, and uh, he was a tenacious tenacious fighter, mm-hmm. and very strong willed. It showed. I mean, uh, like all through our life, my dad. If I were to start a sentence on my dad, I would start it with he was a very hard hunter. When I was young, and we went hunting, we always went before left before uh, sunrise. We were always out in the field before the sun rose. And we left as it was setting. We hunted all day, and we and we always came home with game. He was nice. just a, a, a hard man, very uh, strong-willed, and uh, very deliberate in a lot of things that he did, but very wow. fair. I love it. Around 9:30 a.m., the hostile fire ceased, and the three men that were left from his QRT that were not wounded were finally being relieved from their duty. But your dad was asked to stay on. What did your dad have to do next? Well, the next thing they did is they uh, counted the bodies. They went through and they counted the bodies and rounded up, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, BC that were left there. And, uh, and they made a count going through there uh, and, you know, looked at all the weapons that were left. And they actually found some explosive ordinances that weren't used because they BC didn't have time to hook them up. Right. And if they had done that, there would have been a lot more damage. And I think they realized just how outgunned they were when they found the RPGs, the grenades that they had, the explosive ordinance that was there. Uh, They realized not only how many BC had been there, 90 to 100, but just how well armed they were and how ill-armed, you know, they only had M16s and my dad's 38 and no communication devices. Right. So this is something that my dad reported when it was time for him to, you know, they all had to report what what had happened. And this is one of the main things that my dad brought up uh, just about how uh, They really needed more ordnance and weapons when they when this happened again, and they needed uh, communication devices. Well, and and you know when you were just talking about what he saw in, in the field, and I had this for a question a little bit later, but we can incorporate it now. Um, the clay mine specifically that he saw them laying out, the wires were not connected, but they were in the process of connecting and putting them together. So giving just a little bit more time, if they had that ability, that would have been such a huge difference, a game changer for them. And I I can't imagine like in your dad's mind, him walking through and seeing the, the wires in the clay mines sitting alongside of each other and just what he just saw laying before them you know that that's just unbelievable yeah the claymore mines usually you just put those out with a wire and there's usually like a a little clicking device and i think it's like three bolts that will set those off they just didn't have time to totally set wire those or set those up and if those had been set up it would have been really really bad for them yes absolutely god was definitely with them you know all the way through As he was counting the bodies and seeing the remains of some of the bodies, along with the the weapons that were left behind, he noticed some of the pictures the VC had of their families and that the VC were carrying with them, just as Americans and other soldiers would do. Um, When your dad was done making an account of this battle, he sat down and what did he do? Well, he cried. I mean, after it was all done, this is kind of like what a lot of men do after battle. And, you know, when things are settled and there's a big lull and it's quiet and, and, and you've got a chance to take everything in, I think he, he thought about, you know, how close they'd really come to being overrun or could have been overrun and that uh, everyone there really, even himself, could have been killed. And that hits you. Yeah. And I think he just, he, he cried. He cried for the men that were killed. There were three men total killed. I think the two men that he had mentioned, and I think 
the first one was the uh, canine uh, guy that who first reported it, who yelled over the uh, uh, the wire that uh, they just killed his dog. Mm. And I guess the next thing they did was they killed him. That was yeah. his last words. So mm -hmm. the canine sentry and his two other men, they were the, uh, and three, it mentions here that three canine dogs were killed. Two were wounded. Three airmen were killed. The two in his QRT and the one canine handler. Fifteen were men were wounded. Wow. And, and the other thing he did, um, not only for his soldiers, but for the VC's families, when he saw those as pictures, especially, um, he prayed for them, you know, and, and he prayed for just everyone. And that, that is such a God, godly thing to do was to pray for both, both sides, you know, and then I'm sure also adding in to praying for an end you know, to this. I'm sure that was an ongoing prayer for him during the whole time that he was there. When he was able to see afterwards, he noticed that they could have used another weapon effectively to have quickly end the battle that they were in, um, seeing how close they really were. What was that weapon that they could have used? Well, I don't remember that, but probably grenades. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a lot of grenades and, uh, they did use some of those, but they could have used those. And, and his men, of course, they didn't have any. But oh, they were yeah. well armed with not only, like I said, their AK-47s and the RPGs and the mortar fire. And uh, they had, uh, you know, grenades. Mm -hmm. Now, this was something your dad initially trained the men uh, with before battle. That that was one of the big things that he would train them with the grenades and how to hold them. Um what was the method that he used to teach them to use the grenades? Well, if I remember correctly, the great grenade had about, I think it was a 13 and a half seconds. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure of that, but 13, 14 and a half seconds, 13 and a half seconds, I think. And he taught them to, when he released the grenade, the pen, to count to four or five and then throw it. And the reason is so that, that the VC couldn't pick the grenade back up and throw it back at <laughs> Throw it back, yeah. Too much time. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, those grenades, usually, if it's a 13 and a half second fuse, you want to count to five. Mm -hmm. And then by the time you throw it and it lands, no one has a chance to pick it back up and throw it back at you. So important. Yeah, so that's something that was really important. <laughs> now, this part is another part that I really like about your dad. On December 5th, 1966, when he returned to the 633rd Air Base, uh, Plika Air Base, Air Base, what did he and the RVN that were with him do immediately as they returned to the base? I'm trying to remember exactly what they did. Uh, I know that they were probably hungry. Mm, yeah. Uh, let's see what his notes are. Uh, so of course they ate, but um, there was something special well, they that went they to church. They immediately went to church. Yes. Church on, on the, the hill. hill. Thank God for their safe return. And yes. he mentions here, he says, if I live to be 200 years old, I don't believe I'll ever again come as close to death as I did from 1.15 a.m. to 11 a.m. on December 4, 1966 at Tonsa Air Base. Just amazing. No now, of my life remains so vividly. He said he went through several stages during that period from being frightened being concerned about disappointing his wife, Mary Frances, and his four children, mm -hmm. my sister Cheryl, my sister Sarah, me, and Ray, and if he didn't survive, to being very angry and determined to prevail. Airman Cole, Airman Riddle, and Airman Vivek gave everything their lives. Those are right. the three men that died. Right. Yeah, the first thing they did is they went to church. Now, do you think the RVN that was with him, do you think he had... Uh, he became a Christian after that? Did, he, did your dad say anything about that? It, it's hard to say. Um, he just says that uh, um, he returned to the to play here, Arvin, and immediately, I guess that's one, maybe Arvin or several, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But they went with dad to the church. I think they too, being in that battle, maybe experienced something. Yes. But they were all going to give thanks for, you know, being alive. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you also mentioned that your dad had a dream after that about Jesus. And what was this dream and vision that he had about Jesus? Well, my dad just told me, and I don't know if it was after that event, but I do remember vividly my dad telling me one day that he had a dream that he was up on a hill and that he was standing, as he was standing there, Jesus Christ approached him and put him, his arm around him and said, this is my friend. I love that. And I, you know what? I truly believe that that happened with your dad. I, I truly believe that that was something that he really saw. And, and you know, God has done that for different people in, in their life. It's not just the biblical accounts in the Bible when things like that happen. And I, I truly feel that God was connecting with him and allowing him to have that vision of connection back with Jesus. I think that's amazing. Well, he had such respect for things. And I saw it, you know, as a young boy, when we would go hunting, how he would respect uh, game. Anything we shot, we took home and we ate. We never shot for fun, shot anything for fun. Uh, it was very serious. This was food that was provided for us. Growing up, probably more than half or three quarters of our food was game. We had a freezer out on the back porch and it was filled with fish and quail and, and uh, duck and, and everything game-wise. And we ate a lot of that. And he had such respect for nature. And like I said, for the game that we hunted uh, and, and for people and for property. I just remember always being to, told to respect people's property, never to destroy another person's property or mm -hmm. to respect the game. And it's just the way he lived his life. That respect for, I think, for, for, uh, for nature, for animals, for people, for property, for life, uh, that, that, that really defined him. Yes. And, and I think, you know, he was a hard man. My dad was a really hard man. Uh, but he was a respectful man and a fair man. Mm -hmm. And I always respected that uh, about him. Yes. And take a lot of those lessons from him. Yes. Do you now, do you uh, eat game sometimes? Um, you know, like quail or duck? Do you still have that in your, um, in your diet? Or you no. guys go out? Not as much. I think when I was a young man, now I think hunting is so different than it was when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. We used to could go out to farms and my dad would just show his badge, you know, that he was a federal marshal. And a lot of uh, farmers would give us permission to hunt on their land. A lot of that land is not there anymore. Right. And there are gun clubs now and things like that. And, um, you know, as kids, we always grew up, my dad always had lots of guns around the house and we, we respected that. We never touched them. Mm -hmm. And I was such that I enjoyed going hunting with my dad, but I don't do that much today. My kids grew up a little different. I, I can't see any of my kids <laughs> wanting to shoot something. It would tear them apart, I think. Right. It's just a different time and a different era. It really is. I enjoyed yeah. doing that with my dad, but I didn't do it as much myself. Yeah. And just like you said, our, you know, our demographics have drastically changed. You know, the, the farmlands and the, the woods and stuff, you know, we're, we're not having that as much. Our green spaces, that makes a difference also in this type of culture that we're talking about, you know? Well, exactly, Mike. Dad grew up in a time where uh, he would sometimes go out and get a rabbit or something like that. You know, him growing up with six, with five brothers and my grandmother, he went out and killed a rabbit in the morning, brought it home. That was, that was uh, breakfast or lunch for them. Yeah. And, and they all worked in the sawmill and my dad only went to school, I think to the third or fourth grade. And of course he got his GED, but uh, they all had to work, work on the farm, work in sawmills to help support the family. And there were big families back then, eight, 10 kids. Right. To run the farm, it was a necessity. Uh, Every that time has changed. Mm -hmm. And my dad grew up with respect for that. 
And our times, of course, you know, are different. We buy everything. Yeah, there are still do. a lot of a good people that love to hunt out there. It's just uh, different. There are a lot of crazies out there. That's why I would be afraid to be out in the woods with a, a shotgun or a rifle because you never know who else is out there. Right. But when we were doing it back when I was doing it. It was, uh, you know, it was pretty safe and it was pretty good. Yeah. It's just a different time now. Absolutely. Uh, one of the questions I had earlier was something that you had told me was that he would drop sea rations for the villagers from time to time. Now, how often did he do that and why was it that he did that? Well, he did that. There was a, a captain uh, on the base that would fly. It was almost like a, I would call it a Piper Cub, a single engine plane. Uh, almost like not a biplane, but a, a, like a Piper Cub or something like that. And they flew these planes for reconnaissance. Uh, he would fly it low over the jungles and areas near the base to uh, spot VC or where the Vietnamese were, Viet Cong were, uh, and their strongholds or where they were uh, held up and, and stuff like that. And this uh, flyer, this, this uh, Arvin, this regular Vietnamese uh, army, I guess, was a captain, wanted my dad to fly with him because he felt like if his plane was shot down, he'd have a good chance of getting back because he knew my dad was a master of all weapons and my dad would carry with him his M16, uh, maybe uh, his a, a 38 and a whole bunch of uh, ammo with him and some grenades. So he would be well armed. So he would fly. My dad would fly with him and they would fly low over these jungles. And what they would do when they flied over the village, flew over the villages, they would drop sea rations. And the reason they would drop sea rations is that they would hope that the villagers would then befriend them if they ever got shot down and would help them get back to the base. So they did it as a ploy to hopefully uh, enable the VC to become, or the villagers to become their friends because they love these sea rations mm -hmm. and they hope that they would be, hope, be beholden to them if they were ever shot down. <laughs> and my dad flew with them a lot of times and they, they flew low over the jungle and they uh, were able to point out some VC positions because a lot of times when they flew low over the jungle, they were shot at. Mm -hmm. And the plane was hit from time to time with wow. small ammo. Wow. So that's why that happened. Well, and you know what, um, with the next interview, we'll talk about the other battle that he had, but I remember when you showed me the map and you had circled every place that he had uh, served at in Vietnam, there was about 20 different locations, 20 to almost 30 locations that you had circled throughout Vietnam. And one thing I read shortly after that was that these attacks on the air freight on the air bases were something that happened regularly. And so that might've been partially why, right? That he would go from one base to another. Well, exactly too. And for training purposes too. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, one of his missions while he was there, while he was the non-commissioned officer in charge of security uh, for the bases that he was at, he was uh, charged with um, uh, training a lot of these men. So he would perhaps travel to some of these other air bases to train these men, especially those who were in charge of the security of the planes and the cargo and the security of the perimeter of the base. Mm -hmm. Because my dad was a master of that. And I do remember when I went to visit my dad, how much respect he had from his men. Mm -hmm. They I always imagine. thought of dad as a father figure and they really loved him and respected him. Yeah. because he respected them and he had their back and took care of them. And I do remember when I went to visit him on Christmas at Van Rang, I rode in the Jeep with him around the perimeter, checking on his men mm -hmm. that were either in towers or bunkers, you know, uh, for that evening uh, for security. But he always checked on his men. And I drove with him in that Jeep around and he would be checking on them. And he had a walkie talkie where he could to communicate with them uh, to see what was going on. But he, they knew that he had their back. And, and that was he, really important. 
That was very important. Some of the ones, especially the ones that you were, when he visited you and some of the fellow soldiers that were with him, you could see a couple of times where he showed um, his just lighthearted spirit um, in, in that you guys were able to have just a little bit of that, like you said, camaraderie and they really respected him. But yet at the same time, you know, you guys were able to see uh, a little bit of a softer side of him in regards to uh, you guys had uh, poured water on him one time, right? He got water poured on him. Well, yeah, when I went to visit him at Fan Rang, they just opened a latrine, which was a treat. It had toilets in it <laughs> and a shower. And to break it in, uh, a lot of guys grabbed each other and threw each other in the shower and uh, I got thrown in the shower and my dad got thrown in the shower and it was just <laughs> a lot of fun. And when my dad came to visit me for Thanksgiving in 69, I believe, my dad went on patrol with my buddies. I was on guard duty at the time and I have a picture of my dad and the, the I think, 14 or 15 or so guys that went on patrol and my dad went with them to patrol our area just to see what was going on out there to check it out to see if there were any, you know, VC or caches that were there. A lot of times VC will stash weapons and stuff like that uh, prior to an attack or something like that. And they went around the area checking it. And my dad went with him. And I have a picture of that in front of the uh, guardhouse before they went on patrol because I couldn't go because I was on, on guard duty. But my mm. dad went with them oh. on that patrol. Yeah, you and your dad were able to have not only Thanksgiving together, but I saw the the uh, dinner flyer that you had for Christmas. I think that's just amazing. That's very unique that you guys were able to share a few times together uh, and two holidays at the very least. We had about three times uh, together, actually, that I remember. My dad came to visit me for Thanksgiving. I flew on a C-120 to... I have uh, Christmas with him. And then there was a time when I think my dad was on TDY and he was coming through. And I don't exactly remember when, but he did come by for like two or three days uh, and spend some time with me. And uh, that was just, you know, we spent a lot of time talking and uh, with my other buddies and things like that. So yeah, that was a, that was, that was special that we were able to in passing, let's spend some time together and as a fact just to tell you you know i'm an only son and i think with both of us being there i could have requested at any time to you know go home mm. because i'm an only son wow. and us being there together but i that really to be honest with you never crossed my mind yeah i, I think that's amazing and that is a good point to bring up i have seen that before i've read about that before that if you are the only son that that could be something where you could have opted out and and I'm so glad that you didn't because even for your service you know the, the communications that you had at your base it, that could have very well made a difference in an, a not so good way for your fellow comrades that you were with you know I'm thinking about it too my dad as I mentioned spent three years in Vietnam uh three different times uh but was there for a total of three years and I was there consecutively for 26 months, two years and two months. Mm -hmm. Mine was a critical MOS. And they had asked that, you know, I uh, extend my tour. And I did twice. You could do six month extensions. I was there a year, I extended for six months and then another six months, but I was held over an extra two months. And I don't remember why, uh, but it was a total of 26 months. And so I got a, uh, an early out. I got a nearly three or four months early out. If you had, I think three to four months left on your time in the service and you were in Vietnam, you could get an early out. So I didn't spend the full three years in the army. I only spent two years and nine months. I got a three month early out. That's, it was close though. It was yeah. close. Now, um, in October 1997, your dad, and this is much later, of course, your dad went to Pensacola, Florida to attend 
a Vietnam Security Police Association's reunion. He saw one of the QRT air policemen that was wounded on December 4th, 1996. I mean, 1966, excuse me. Who was it that he saw? He saw, and his name is Ted Janiak, J-A-N-I-A-K. Uh, he was a member of his, his 15 uh, quick response team. Uh, and uh, and he was one of the nine wounded. And uh, he uh, he's uh, now deceased, Ted is, mentions. Mm -hmm. But he was the only member of his quick response Bonds team that he was able to meet wow. at that time. And all of the nine, including him, were awarded the Purple Heart. Yes. And uh, he, uh, of course, has visited the wall in Vietnam. And he said he's uh, seen Airman Coles and Airman Riddles and Airman Beavich, B E V I C H, on the wall. And oh, I nice. I remember my dad taking a piece of paper up there and stenciling their names. Yes. So that's what it was, because I saw that picture as well, where he had the paper on there and stenciled their names. Yeah. And, and And that's pretty cool. He did that a couple times. He went to the wall, not just once, but they had a... I think a couple of times he did. And every time he's gone, he told me he did, he cried. Hmm. Uh, it was such an overwhelming experience. And I mean, I, I have not gone to the Vietnam Wall, but I will tell you the truth. If I ever do stand in front of it or ever go there, I know that I'll cry. I imagine. It's just, I think it's an overwhelming moment when you see those over 50,000 names on that wall. Yeah. It is an uh, overwhelming moment. I bet. I bet I haven't been able to go yet, but I could just imagine um, just all of that history in one place, the commemoration of so much history in one place. You know, that's, that's, uh, I think that it just causes just moments of reflection. And even if you, like for you, it, and for everyone that has served, it is a different feeling. But I think that if people took those moments and when they do go to Washington, one of my friends just went for spring break. They, they took their family and went. And it's such a moment of reflection. And uh, it teaches us so much, you know, and it can teach the young people so much to be able to take the time to make that trip and go see the, that, all of it that there is in Washington, D.C., you know. And I, I've heard that it does take different trips to be able to really take in all that there is, the details of it, and all that there is to, to not only, you know, some of the information, but there's so much more being there that you can learn, you know, um, just by being there. Yeah, um, it's, a somber, it's a somber experience. And my dad even mentioned the statue that's there. He said is is something else that really affected him. No. Now, the other airmen did get the Purple Heart. Um, your father wanted to know how the soldiers had served. He had served with on the QR team we're doing after the war. What did he do to reach out to them? Well, I think he went to this one site that I mentioned to you, and he put out... Um, uh, something on that site where he would like to, you know, talk to or, or hear from any of the other men that were involved in that, in that battle. And up until the time he passed away, I think he was always searching mm -hmm. for, for some of these men. And a lot of them have passed away. The, the captain that put him in for the Silver Star, uh, Captain Five, passed away. Mm -hmm. And as you know, Kathy, a lot of us, or a lot of the people that, that uh, served in uh, Vietnam have passed away. Kind of like the World War II vets, there are very few left. Mm -hmm. And our numbers for the Vietnam veterans that served are getting, are dwindling as well. I mean, I was a young man when I went. I was 18 years old. I'm 70, almost 73 now. Wow. So, and I was a young man. So many of our ranks are, 
are dwindling as well. Yes, it, it's become more aware to me to also be looking just as equally for World War II vets, for Vietnam veterans as well, you know, and, and there are other, like I said, there are other people that are doing this. It's not just me, but it ab absolutely has opened my eyes to, even though the, the time frame is different between the two wars, that the numbers are just not, there's not a lot of the veterans. And I think the Agent Orange played a big part in that. It is what it is, unfortunately. Well, it is. And, you know, I don't think we're going to have another war where, you know, we had so many casualties. There are over 50, 53, I don't know, 50,000 men, over 50,000 men that have, uh, were killed in Vietnam. And another sad thing is that more than that have committed suicide since coming back. More than 50,000 men have committed suicide. And that shows that it was very distressing war. Uh, it affected a lot of men. It affected a lot of people in a lot of ways. As I, you know, as I like to tell my wife sometimes, sometimes the Vietnam War, that was the event in a man's life. For me, it was an event in my life, not the event. Mm. But for some men, it was the event. The event. And for others, it was an event. And that can affect how you live your life or feel going forward. Yes. It, it, my uncle was one of those that it affected him as the event. And he didn't, he didn't live long after he came back, you know, sadly. Um, but yeah, I mean, the ability to overcome the things that you see in life, um, no matter, you know, I mean, in circumstances with war, but also in our life every day, when you have different, uh, events that are so pressing on you that could be, um, what do you call it, traumatic, that, you know, that ability to overcome it is such a, it's, it's not everyone that can, but I do like the way that you put it. It was a, an event for you, but it was the event th for, for some people, so many, that it caused them to not be able to move forward, you know. Now, yeah. um, your dad was up for three silver stars, but never got them. Why didn't he get them? And what award did he receive instead for his part of his military service in, in the Vietnam War? Well, from what I can tell, what I have downstairs, so what I have are, are, I believe, two bronze stars and the Army, uh, our Air Force Accommodation Medal. Uh, or I'm not sure if I have three silver stars, but I know I have two, I have two bronze stars and the Air Force Commendation Medal that he received. He was put in for three silver stars. And for that battle that we just talked about, he was put in for a silver star by his captain, Captain uh, Fox. And Captain Fox, I think once when my dad saw him later, he asked him, did he receive the silver star that he put him in for? And my dad said, no, he, was, he received the bronze star. Uh, it's disappointing because he was put in for three silver stars and received only two bronze stars. And it seems like, you know, he was on the front line holding down the VC. The reinforcements that came, some of those captains or some of those officers received the silver star. And he got bronze star. And this is something that he uh, tried to correct up until his death in... Um, November of 2000 and I believe one mm. but sadly I do remember receiving a letter after his death that that had been turned down again this that's death, just he died, he put in for it and it was turned down it was denied that, that's just so sad. he did get you know the bronze stars and the uh, Air Force accommodation medal uh, and so many other different awards he did get uh, a uh, very high medal from Vietnam, almost like their Medal of Honor, I think, really. And I, I have that, that he received from Vietnam. But he received a lot of awards, but I think he was just disappointed that he didn't receive those uh, silver stars that he was, that had been put in for. 
Yes. Because I, I think he deserved them in, in the I think so too. manner that he conducted himself and what he did. But for yeah. whatever reason, uh, he did not, not get those. And, and I do think about that as I've looked over your dad's story, talked with you. And it make, even though I didn't know your dad, it makes me sad for him that he was not honored in that way. You know, but the bottom line is like, this is something that we always go back and forth with, with um, what we learn in church. You know, I facilitate women's studies, but we do hear it from time to time. The things that we do, we do it for God. And, you know, the, and I, I remind myself of this when I do volunteer work, but I also think that you're, and I know your father probably went back and forth as much as he was disappointed in the fact that he never received that. There was that part of him probably that said, you know what? I did everything I did, I did for God. And it was to honor and protect our country. And, and I, I know that he went and tried to receive this up till he was, you know, he had passed. But I, I just think there's that part of him that reminded himself that he did what was right. And he, in his own way, he, he should have received it, you know? It is something that was due to him, but first and foremost, he did everything for God's glory. And that, that's the way we absolutely are supposed to live. Well, you know, the way I think of it too, Kathy, you're exactly right, is that, you know, you, when you go, you can't take any of those medals or those things with you. What you take with you in your final days, what you take with you when you pass is who you were and what you did. Yes. You take that with you. Yes. That kind of person that you are, if you are a decent person who respects life, respects people, and did certain things in your life that, that honored God or, or you did for your country, you take that with you. You don't take any of those awards with you. Absolutely. What you take with you is who you are and what you did and what yes. defined you. That's the yes. only thing that you can take with you, that goes with you. That's it. And you know what? That's one of those things that becomes clear the older you get with certain scriptures that tell us things like that. Both those things go hand in hand. We're not supposed to um, buy for, do things to acknowledge, you know, that look at me, look at what I'm doing. But also we can't take those things with us. And the, the two go hand in hand because what it does is it, it won't take us off the focus of what we are supposed to be doing. And your dad never left that focus with everything, not only his Vietnam journey, his World War II journey, then Korean War, Vietnam, but then later, as we'll talk in the next interview, him as a, as a marshal after his, you know, after he left Vietnam. And, and so his journey is the legacy that God would had for him and you have the benefit that goes beyond uh, rewards to be able to pass down to your family and the people that get to see this, to be able to see the man that he was, you know, that's, uh, that's something that gets to be passed down as a part of who he was. And that's what God wants us. When we hear that everyone has a purpose, it's the legacy that we can leave for others and inspiration, you know? Yeah. You know, he never, like we, we, we talked about this battle, there were others and things that he did, but he never really bragged or talked about any of these things to any of us kids at any time that I can remember. The only time he would say something about it is if we asked, mm -hmm. but he never really talked about any of this. He wrote it down, he reported it, and he had his different groups or his buddies that he would meet with, and I'm sure they would discuss it but it was nothing that was really brought up at, uh, at any time, or any of his exploits of what he did. He had stories and things like that of what he's a federal marshal, funny stories and stuff like that, but he never really, like I said, bragged or talked about any of this to any of us or that I know of, that I remember. Well, and, and some of the things he did instead was he journaled and he was very busy with his, his, his job that he did after the war. Um, and I think a lot of that, part of it was declassifying. Things were not declassified till later. Not exactly. only 
not only with his service, but with some of the people I've interviewed, some of that information has just now become declassified for some of them, you know? So, so right. it's- You're right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that was a part of it, but also I think some of it was, he didn't want to necessarily maybe share some of those details, some of the things, you know, just right. to, just for his reasons. You know, exactly. now um, we'll talk about his other battle in the next interview and what, and like I said, his career afterwards, because that's a, an amazing career that um, follows after his Vietnam service. And um, it, for now, is there anything that I left out uh, about your dad's service time that you would like to add to the interview? I think that you've pretty much covered everything. Uh, it was a long uh, career in the service, uh, 27 years uh, in the Air Force. And then, uh, you know, well, that's like 20 years as a marshal. So that's 47 years served mm. uh, for the government, for this country. So I think he did his job. He did it well. And I think that you've done a really good job of bringing out a lot of the things that, uh, that he not only did, but the kind of person that he was. And that's really important. I can't really add anything, Kathy, at this point. I really appreciate your, your time and your looking into this. And I think you covered it very well. Well, well thank you. And I really enjoyed um, reading about everything that your dad has been doing, that had, had, he had done in the past. And I, I will be looking into more of this other battle that he was in and researching it more. I've already started, but this one right here was just amazing. And to as a Christian, being able to see where God was definitely with them, these are the kind of stories that I really love to be able to, to share with others that, that experience that. Um, and I'm sure that he did that if he did talk about some of the ways some of the battles that he was in, it probably was in the sense of where God can show up in the midst of adversity. Absolutely. You know? And I hope you'll take the time, like I said, to go to that 377 security police empty chairs. I think you'll be surprised. You'll see dad's picture in there and a lot of other men that were in that uh, police squadron. I absolutely will, because I, I am curious to see what some of those men look like and more of what the training look like for your dad. So I definitely will be looking into that. Well, thank and you. You're welcome. And thank you for your time. And thank you for sharing your dad's story. Appreciate you, Kathy. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, you're so welcome. And I hope that you have a good day and we'll talk soon. All right, Kathy. See you later. Bye-bye.